Okay, well, very good. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to the University of Toronto Citywide Geriatric Medicine Grand Rounds, as well as the 2021 Dr. Rory Fisher Lecture. I'm Dr. Barbara Liu, the um, Division Head of Geriatric Medicine at the U of T, and also the Executive Director of the Regional Geriatric Program of Toronto. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event. Um, the usual housekeeping uh, Zoom protocol of please keep yourselves on mute, particularly important today because we have a very large audience expected to join us. Um, you're free to uh, enter your questions using the chat function. We'll hold the questions, however, and address them at the end of the presentation in the Q&A section. I wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto and the Regional Geriatric Program of Toronto operate. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wyandotte, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Many of us here today, myself included, are settlers or immigrants from this generation or generations past. We are mindful of the history of colonialism on this land and that we all must play a role in reconciliation. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful for the opportunity to work on this important traditional territory. As I mentioned, today's lecture is a special one. It is the 2021 Dr. Rory Fisher Lecture. And this lectureship was established by the Regional Geriatric Program of Toronto to honor Dr. Fisher's leadership and pioneering work in geriatrics. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Fisher joining us here today. So I will embarrass him by telling you a little bit about his many accomplishments. In 1971, Dr. Fisher was recruited to Sunnybrook Hospital as its first geriatrician. He quickly established an impressive array of geriatric services, including the first geriatric day hospital in Ontario, the second one in Canada. And he introduced interprofessional approaches to geriatric care through an acute geriatric unit, an outpatient geriatric clinic, a specialty continence clinic, a geriatric consultation service throughout the hospital, including a dedicated geriatric orthopedic link, something that we're hearing a lot about in current uh, practice today. As an academic leader, Dr. Fisher has a number of firsts to his credit. He was the University of Toronto's first program director of postgraduate geriatric subspecialty training. He was the first departmental division director of geriatrics. He was the first head of the interdepartmental division of geriatrics. And for more than 20 years, he was head of the Department for Extended Care at Sunnybrook. He has mentored and trained many successful and recognized names in geriatric medicine, many of whom are here today with us. And he was also recognized for his outstanding contributions to the field and to society through many, many awards, including the Distinguished Service Award from the Canadian Geriatric Society, the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, and the Order of Ontario. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Professor Brian Dolan, who is our speaker for this year's Rory Fisher Lecture. Professor Dolan has a clinical background in both mental health and emergency nursing, and he's the director of an award-winning consultancy called Health Services 360. He works in the UK, New Zealand, Australia, and Ireland, and in fact is joining us today from New Zealand. So it is currently four o'clock in the morning on Friday for uh, mm. Professor Dolan. He's best known for his work as the originator of the hashtag NPJ paralysis campaign that encourages patients to mobilize while in hospital, and also for the campaign The Last Thousand Days, which is about valuing patients' time as the most important currency in healthcare. Professor Dolan is Honorary Professor of Leadership in Healthcare at the Salford University and Visiting Professor of Nursing at the Oxford Institute for Nursing, Midwifery and Allied Health Research. He has offered more than 70 papers and seven books and his latest book is called Dear Deconditioning written with his collaborator, Linda Holt. In 2018, Brian was voted one of the top 20 most influential people in the history of the NHS. And in 2019, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and awarded the OBE, Officer of the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen. We want to share hearty congratulations with Brian as next week he will be celebrating the 40th anniversary of his entering the nursing profession. 
Please welcome Professor Brian Dolan to talk to us about the other pandemic. I'll hand over the slides to you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you uh, so very much. Um, not least for that very generous obituary. And actually, you're just listening to uh, you know about doc, about you, Doctor Fisher, and and you know as as we'd say in Ireland, you are some man for one man. You've clearly been you know a remarkable achiever, and 50 years ago yourself. So next Tuesday is my 40th uh, anniversary, and we're, we're in my nursing class. We're all in mental health nursing class because we trained in the West of Ireland. We're all going. Where did that go? That'll be the first thing on the uh, the item on the agenda. But what I'm going to walk, to, what we're going to talk through now for about the next, um, next about 30, 35, 35 minutes or so, just talk around what I perceive as the other less um, renowned pandemic, but the one that is uh, no less significant and in some respects will have just as long and already even bigger tail, and that's the tail of deconditioning. And what I've said to, to Dr. Liu, uh, the slide decks will be ready available for you. There's a book chapter, which I'm happy to share, and also some, some links. So I'm not a big fan of hoarding knowledge information. So anyone who wants any of this content, really very, very welcome. So you get the classic Oxford English uh, Dictionary for it, or, or Farlex and Partner, talking about the loss of physical fitness due to a failure to maintain uh, the uh, optimal levels of physical activity or training. Um, here's a, a further definition um, co-authored by myself and a wonderful geriatrician, Dr. Amit Aurora, um, where we construed it as a comprising physical, psychological and functional decline that occurs as a consequence of prolonged bed rest, but also linked to it, uh, uh, muscle strain to commonly experienced throughout hospitalization, but now it's crept into the home. And when you look at the prevalence estimates, you know, 83% of a patient's time is spent in a bed, 12% in, in a chair. But physical acti inactivity is the sixth commonest cause of early mortality in England alone. It's up there with smoking. And Public Health England in last month, in fact, did a, a, a very major piece of work, which I also specifically talked about in the, in the uh, in its headline about the impact of deconditioning through locked after lockdown into deconditioning with an anticipated 110,000 extra falls, but two thirds of older people actually experience declining function while they are in hospital. And it does often strike me that, you know, we would actually think of our health system as being very successful as a closed rehabilitation beds, because too often people go to rehabilitation to recondition from the deconditioning that has occurred as a consequence of their acute episode uh, in hospital. And maybe a system success would be that there was fewer rehab beds needed. But, you know, we've known this and and uh gerontologists you know have known this for many many years but right back to the 1940s before the nhs was founded dr richard asher a, a renal physician talked about the the dangers of going to bed and teach me to live that i may dread the grave as little as my bed and although he didn't talk about conditioning it, he identified through every single body system that had an impact that may be one of the better known, in fact, it's one of the 20 most influential papers of the 20th century in the BMJ. But you go back even further through JAMA, 1899 and 1944, even then it was identified as a problem keeping people in bed. I sometimes think that if there was a plot, somehow we had a plotectomy and lost it because we started keeping people in beds, particularly in the last couple of decades. But God lover, I couldn't be I couldn't be a nurse and not talk about Florence Nightingale. And with 40 years under my belt, I think she was only a couple of sets ahead of me. But she talked about it's now well-known role to keep no patient in hospital a day longer than is absolutely necessary. And um, if anyone's on, uh, if you're off mute, if you put yourself on to mute, if you will, pretty please, you know, to keep no patient in hospital a day longer than is absolutely necessary. And even this may be days too long because the patient may have to recover not only from the illness or injury, but from hospital. You know, for years and years, we've said to people, go to hospital, you'll, you'll be safe there. And now we're going, yeah, about that. 
So, he, you know, and also I should also say, Florence Nightingale recognized the value of people's time. There's the, the this is a shameless bug. And in fact, Elsevier in a wonderful uh, book edited by Dr. Shane O'Hanlon um, from, from uh, County Kerry, so from Ireland. He's run this, done this book on rehabilitation and this is the chapter which Elsevier have allowed uh, accessible for free and is available to everyone. But let's start drilling in as, as you know, some of the details. I know many of you will be very, very familiar with this, you know, muscle strength reducing one to 1.5% per, uh, per day and up to 20%. And most of that is in the lower limb anti-gravity muscles. Um, you look at the muscle loss of so the one and a half kilos of which one kilo is from the hips, gluteal mass muscles, quad muscles, the ones that enable standing where people may be able to mobilize when they walk into the hospital, they walk into the ambulance, but they don't walk out of the hospital as a consequence of deconditioning. Bone demineralization and total body calcium reducing, circulatory blood volume dropping. And you know, when you look at people who have a fractured neck of femur when they are in hospital, they fall in hospital even in fractured neck of femur, it happens six or seven days, days out, it comes towards often at the end of their stay. And I think it's partly related to bone demineralization, body calcium loss. They, they, they get all excited because they're going home, they drop the blood pressure and they fall and they're taking the head off the acetabulum. Because, and this I know, nobody goes to work to do a bad job. And the one thing is the impact it has on staff as well. VO2 max reducing by 0.9% a day. A 1% of a loss of aerobic capacity, in fact, is about the ability to pick up a cup of tea. Pulmonary secretions, uh, increase inefficient co uh, cough, blood glucose reducing, you know, because of, of, of um, at muscular level. Um, you start looking through, in fact, this is a conversation that was held only a few hours ago when I was presenting alongside Dr. Aurora and other colleagues. Um, Amory Riley, the chief nurse of, of, of North, North Midlands, talking about 40 to 50% of older people becoming incontinent after 24 hours. And fantastic that Dr. Fisher has done a lot of work in that, that space. Skin and com integrity compromise, UTIs, all of these things are going on. And then you add in lethargy, a sense of loss of, you feel miserable about feeling miserable, that sense of loss of torpor and independence, peristalsis slows down. If you're not mobilizing, you're not going to be feeling hungry because you're not burning calories. So you get this, this vicious circle of people feeling miserable about feeling miserable and the consequences of it. And we have not been teaching this stuff in university settings, in certainly in nursing, but also elsewhere. We have work, truly. We have a lot of work that we must do. And if for those who prefer a more visual uh, way of seeing it, this is uh, this is another way of framing this uh, this picture as well. You know, a week in a hospital bed, in terms of quad power, muscle mass, inactivity, pressure sores, falls, all of those dimensions. So that's kind of like that's the background about what it does and how it. And the book, in fact, I'm I'm still working on. Um, we'll in the whole, hopefully, we'll have this out before before Christmas. And we have started a podcast series called Dear Deconditioning as well. So how did NPJ, well, actually was born, NPJ Paris was born in the New South Wales outback. And it was, um, it was in response to Anne-Marie, who I mentioned, and other colleagues who all nurses, Tim Gillard, uh, Pete Gordon. And my answer to their question was, nursing was born in the church and raised in the army and leading patients in pajamas is their uniform, which within days turned into end PJ paralysis because people go into pajama uh, to hospital, they get in their pajamas and they are paralyzed in their pajamas till the day they leave. And let's fix that. Because when you think about it, if you ever wonder why it's called ICU, now you know. But what is it with the hospital gown represents? People know that there's something wrong. They feel vulnerable and disadvantaged. They feel very disempowered. It's a horrible experience. People don't feel they can question stuff anymore because they feel that they don't, they no longer have the agency to do so. And they may own their sickness, but they don't own the journey of their sickness. And uh, Lisa Morgan and Nicola Cogan et al. from Glasgow, this wonderful piece of work 
where they identified all the different dimensions. I can't remember what their sample was, very substantial sample size, about the symbolic embodiment of what the sick, of what you are as a sick person. It kind of echoes the work of, of Talcott Parsons and, um, you know, the um, AIDS as a metaphor and all that sort of work that was being done and the illness as a metaphor. The emotional, physical, vulnerability these are cold they're unpleasant they're undignified and that sense of you're no longer your sense of self you no longer have any sense of control you have passively given it all away and there's a set of expectations to wear a gown a colleague of mine her husband's a psychiatrist he had a cardiac issue and they, they went he went into hospital for one of his regular checkups and he was you know they said put the gown on and he starts taking his trousers off and, and Nikki, his wife, who's a nurse, said, they're, they're, you know, can you mind just checking that they're actually looking at your chest? You don't need to take your trousers off. But there's a set of expectations where we do this to each other and ourselves as well. But, you know, could you imagine, you know, as doctors, nurses, therapists, graduating, you know, walking through? I don't think that would, well, you know, that's what it feels like for sometimes for, for, our, for our patients. But the thing is, as the wonderful physio Chris Tuckett says, patients don't stop moving because they've deconditioned. They deconditioned because they stopped moving. And the you know, falls are so often thought of to be a problem of mobility, when in fact what they are really is a problem of immobility. And it does strike me that when we talk about falls prevention programs and falls leads, to my mind, that's an, a, a deficit um, a deficit thinking approach to it because what we unintentionally do is we're so focused on the downside we forget that actually a more asset-based approach would be about safer mobility and organizations that are fiscally punished for falls what it leads to as an unintended consequence is people are kept in bed and the other thing is with the greatest of intent what we do is we keep people we keep people in bed we keep them from the risk of falling and we effectively with our kindness with our compassion with our decency we actually are killing people with our kindness and without any intent so how how do you how do you get from that place to a place where you can start to get people mobilizing you can start to get people up and dressed in institutions which have in fact even been physically designed now that have taken out day rooms and places like that. What is it you need to do? And this is where the, the work, the great work of uh, Jeremy Hyman's and Henry Timms comes in. And they wrote a wonderful book called New Power a couple of years ago. And they talk about the three principles for spreading, spreading shade. So for spreading change. And it's actionable, connected, and extensible. And I should say to you, you know, NPJ paralysis, it didn't start with a plan it started with a sense of this is something we can do something about. In fact, it's got a line of sight to the last thousand days, which is about valuing people's time. And if you had a thousand days left to live, how many would you choose to spend in hospital? And that came from a talk I was doing with a group of geriatricians, nurses, therapists about lean thinking in Christchurch, here in Christchurch in New Zealand. Uh, Aotearoa, Rada, land of the long white cloud. And we were talking about all of the types of waste and one of the biggest ways being people's time. And that's when the idea of the last thousand days came to me. And to convert that, se uh, that sense of valuing time into an action, that's where the NPJ paralysis came in. And started, as you saw, at the back of 2016. And in April 2018, we had, it had built enough momentum that we decided to have a campaign across the four countries of the UK, supported by the four chief nursing officers of the four countries, to have a 70, uh, 70 day to reflect the 70th anniversary of the NHS and a million patient challenge. That was the action. The action is to end BJ process. Uh, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, all of these are calls to action. But in fact, the work, the wonderful work of Helen Bevan, an extraordinary global thought leader in health based out of the NHS, and their shared purposes her team came up with, 
our patients, our nurses, our families, our physios, our senior nurse leaders, our doctors, our therapists, our care students, care students, our students, our shared anger and outrage that older people are deteriorating when we can do something about it. And our purpose is to make sure that every person in a hospital bed gets mobilized when they are ready clinically and also personally, that it has to always remain a choice and that every person gets that choice and a chance for the future that they want. And I do want to shout out the wonderful Paul Wright, and I know Jennifer Simon is here, Isabel Hendricks is fantastic as well, all in Alberta, because NBJ Palace has started in, in Calgary. By pure coincidence, Paul is doing a talk at this moment. But I love the stuff that's been localised and some of this work here about some of the, the, um, the leaflets that have been made available for patients to explain it why this stuff matters. And when you make it local and connected and create a message, it helps people to say, this is makes sense because the connectedness is about the facts and the emotional connection. The fact being that deconditioning causes harm and it keeps people in hospital and that steals people's time. Because time is the most important currency in healthcare. And it's the connecting currency of healthcare, if you think about it. Uh, waiting lists are measured in time, access targets measured in time. Harm is caused as a consequence of time ill spent. Time in meetings, which is not adding value, is wasting time. And in fact, 70% of the budget in health in Canada, in the UK, and in fact, in most countries is spent on time because wages and salaries are the purchase of the thing that is our most precious thing, which is our time as well. And that is where time connects health systems. And while our time is busy and important, our patient's time is sacred. But you know, big changes, the cultural shifts, they all start somewhere, usually by one person and then the next, and then a mother making a stand. And you think about this time three years ago, a then 15-year-old Swedish girl decided, you know what, there's no point going to school. There's certainly no point going on a Friday. And look at what Greta Thunberg achieved. But you think about this 42-year-old seamstress, Rosa Parks, who on the 1st of December, 1955, sat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. She had a track record of as of activism, but on this day, this evening, she sat. And where she sat, hundreds marched just around that um, after she got arrested. And one of those who got involved was a young black Baptist minister called Dr. Martin Luther King. And where that line of sight all the way to the 28th of August, 1963, where he stood up and he talked about what he believed in. But could you, you know, this is the thing, it's so important to remember that this is, we don't make our decisions rationally, we make them emotionally and then apply post hoc rationalization to justify the decisions we have made. I'd give you exhibit A as Brexit, but we won't perhaps go there. But you know, when you think about it, you know, could you imagine if Martin Luther King stood on those steps in Washington and said, oh, I've got such a fantastic project plan, wait until you see my Gantt charts. That wouldn't have connected people. What he talked about was his dream because hearts and minds in that order for a reason. But it's worth us remembering, you know, he talked about what he believed. He believed his four black daughters would play with four white children and be judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. How the sons of slaves and the sons of slave owners could sit down together and break bread together. He believed in a better America. That's what he believed in. But it's always worth to remember that most leaders under communicate by a factor of 10. You have to keep repeating it. And just because people have questions, that doesn't mean resistance. Some people love stuff and they love change and want it, they want to get it now. Others need more time to process and ask questions because it's about feeling safe. And our collective jobs as leaders, in whatever role you have, if your role is a leader, your real role, role is to be a director of permission giving. That's what we do. That's what our, our, our place is, is to give others the opportunity. And the question I'll often ask teams when I'm, when I'm doing some work and coaching and leadership work, I'll ask them this question. What would you do if you knew the answer was yes? And it's a seductively simple question, 
which opens up a world of possibility. But you know, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes trust, it takes faith. But it's also remembering that these are three reasons why the patient's time is the most important currency. That 48% of people over the age of 85 will die within one year of a hospital admission. And if you had a thousand days to live, how many would you choose to spend in hospital? So when you trust people to do stuff, they will, they will shine. They will take it on. They will do it on their terms. If people believe what you believe, they will follow. And you heard the likes of Sonia Sparkles, Sonia Nasheen in, in Bradford, coming up with these extraordinary posts. I love the fact that she makes me about 12 years of age in this one. You know, the, all this stuff that, that can be made as table mats and posters, creating signs of people like ministers, you know, of health in Wales, for example, signing this to support it and putting up these posters of commitment. The, the cognitive shift that occurs when you see somebody dress, it says, oh, that person looking a lot better. When we ran this 70-day campaign, by the way, we were getting a lot of informal feedback from folks who were saying the registrars were discharging more people at the weekend because they could see them dress. It's like, well, actually, how do you feel about going home rather than waiting till Monday? And we thought that was an interesting turn of events. So what happened in the end? Well, over time, we that 70 days, we had 710,000 mobilized, 703,000 dressed. Now we may, people thought, oh my gosh, you missed the target. We may have missed the target, but we didn't miss the point. And that's what's important. But also, interestingly, is the, is the number of people dressed, over 700,000. That's, to my mind, represented a shift of way of thinking and behavior. But it also translated into when you mobilize people and they feel safe and they have less falls, it turns into reductions in length of stay across seven and 10 days, uh, 21 days. The number of beds occupied in England, started, you see the, the common sawtooth of weekends that you'll recognize, but also the number of beds uh, occupied reduced. Northwest of England, largest of the organizations, five large or, uh, hospital trusts, they saw a significant reduction in the number of falls over that time, 27%, 67% reduction in pressure sores, because it's hard to get a pressure sore if you're mobilizing, which is, which is great, because when, when things work for patients, we know they work for staff as well. And from Tuesday week, we're running a 70-day challenge in the, in the Republic of Ireland. And we would, in fact, we were presenting about it yesterday. It was just fantastic to see like, folk from all over Ireland not nurses, doctors, therapists, all joining in in the Zoom and we're running webinars and stuff and they'll capture it and it'll be on a phone. They'll capture their data of how many people who are dressed and mobilizing on the phones. And we'll have webinars and lectures and we'll all be just like a phone app, uh, like your, your um, banking apps, you'll be able to access all of this. They will be able to access this content as well. So we've got actionable, connected. And what happens, accessible is a bit of a clunky word, I often think. But what that means is people will take it on and own it and take it into their space. So you see, for example, at the Royal Free, you've got the therapist writing a leaflet because we're having to now say to people, now listen, you know, we used to say to you, take your clothes home. Now we're saying, would you mind leaving them a little bit behind so that we can encourage people. People, for those who didn't have clothes, they were creating little um, clothes banks, which were often run by the healthcare assistants, which was brilliant to see. Never underestimate the power of one person. This woman uh, standing on in blue in the back is Chloe Harris, who's then a brand new graduate physio a couple of years ago. And from family experience, she said, you know, what would it be like if we came to work in our PJ so we knew what it felt like? And you can see there you've got uh, two patients in the front. The chap on the left, on, the, on our left-hand side as we're looking at this, that's a 50-year-old staff nurse. I know what you're thinking. She said, if you saw him, you'd think, how, how could you have aged so much? And Chloe set the trigger of lots of people doing this kind of activity and coming to work and see the staff here across the NHS. If you look in the bottom right, after years of searching, we, we finally found Wally. You could see this is a, myself in, the, in Melbourne with Raj, who was driving to work on the motorway, pulled in onto the side, thinking, please, God, let it be today that we're supposed to wear pajamas as he was in them in his car. 
on the right, the chief executive of Western Health, the lovely big cuddly man there and his crew in the, with the crown. Uh, one of the registrars, uh, we sorted out a very urgent uh, chiropathy appointment for his feet. At least uh, hopefully that's on his feet. But there you can see the dress is nice. And this, what's lovely is about it, people were creating it. And, and it's also about having fun. But more than that, what it does is brought home a really two really powerful messages for staff who did it. One, this is on this is awkward. This feels slightly embarrassing. It's cold. And for a number of medical colleagues, I say, you know, I've worked in this unit with this nurse manager for 15 years. They walked right past me because they were I was in pajamas. And that is that sense of loss of your sense of self, and you become invisible as a patient. People creating playlists. I like to move it, move it. You know, you can't say that without doing it in that tone, can you? I like to move it, move it. Uh, get up, stand up. Um, rewriting the words of Bohemian. In Rhapsody, which I did one night just for the crack, the Irish variety. Is this the real life or PJ fantasy caught in a pat slide, no escape from reality? And it goes on, pajamas, just killed a man, put some PJs on his bed, made him wear it, now he's dead. And then these amazing women sang it, the Dolan sisters, and they, a, a room of a hundred odd people, patients as well, doctors, nurses, managers, and they had a ball. And I think sometimes we, while what we do is serious, and it's got purpose. Sometimes it's also important that we remember to keep joy in what we do as well. And the, the wonderful work of the NHS Highland, the physio called Derek Laidler, creating the classic, from the classic song, Donald Wears Your Trousers. So it makes it central. And that's why I love the work of, of Paul and the team in Alberta, because it's made Canadian. Well, we've been running. We've been running uh, global summits, as, as Dr. Liu alluded to earlier, and you can access. I think we've got about sixty presentations, which you are free to access, share with your your students and colleagues as well. Um, because our view is share, be generous, and as you know, as much as you can, enable, make it as inclusive as it can be for anyone. But, you know, it's 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 been a tough 21 months, hasn't it? It really, really, really has. I'm um, I would often go, you know, go back to the UK about four times. I haven't seen my son since January of last year. And, and we all have these stories, every one of us. It's been tough. And, you know, you look at the kind of work and so many of you have lived this experience. People, are, you know, being able to just through a window, saying goodbye to loved ones on an iPad. As an Irish saying, there's nothing sadder than a small funeral. And, and this picture on the bottom right, all these upended rituals and lives. But this picture I find very striking because that doctor or maybe nurse may not even know in that woman that her jumper is not being pulled fully down. But also, you know, that the, the shielding People, you know, we've, we've seen some work out of the States, you know, dementia accelerating because of loss of cognitive uh, connection to people. The wonderful Dr. Julia holt Lundstad, Canadian psychologist, who identified groundbreaking work a couple of years ago that loneliness has been associated with a 27% increase in early mortality. In other words, equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And, and just as an early heads up, Linda Holt and I, we are going to run a global, a global summit, 16-hour summit on the 8th of December, which will be about loneliness and self-isolation, but oriented towards staff as well, because people who come from foreign lands, they've, they've been doing it tough too and been disconnected from their families and all the stuff around that. But it's, deconditioning is way more than a hospital issue. This is a it's a it's a global issue because with good intent, we've particularly told older and clinically vulnerable people to stay at home. The consequences is when they are presenting, they are more frail. The disconnection. So in in Ireland, I was listening to a group of physios. They were talking about their their patients no longer going to mass no longer going to the to sort of football games and feeling much more socially isolated from where from the loved ones around them. Um, Prehabilitation, much, much tougher for patients preparing for surgery as they have been. And this is a global for everyone. So what do we need to do? 
Well, in reality, as I start drawing this to its close, we focus on the things we can control. In one of my many lives, I was not as an executive director in the NHS, but also a clinical director of a couple of emergency departments. And say to him, look, let us focus not on beds because we can do nothing about that. We will put all our energy into things we can control. 50% 50 of our patients never see another specialty. A lot of the minor injuries and illness, that is nursing business. We will take control of that. And every day, 98% of our patients, we'd see 130 in each department, will be out in under four hours, 98% consistently, because we focus on the things that we could do things about. But this much I know, the followers need the three clarities. Clarity of purpose, which is your why. Clarity of plan, which is your how and your what. And clarity of responsibility is your who. And these are translatable to you know working with your team. What is our purpose? What is our plan? What is our responsibility? For all kinds of things, like your, your, your unit, what it's for, what, how it works, your projects as they are. But you know, when you see somebody like this, gosh, that makes, that makes it all worthwhile. That person who's feeling joyous. And, you know, to my mind, if last century was about trauma, this is the century of the gerontologist. And Dr. Amelia Crabtree, gerontologist, geriatrician in, in Melbourne, she did this beautiful image, you know, gerontologists are like archaeologists. They look past what others see as ruins to the beauty that lies within. And, you know, and if you're a 70 year old now, in 1971, I'll tell you what, you were not listening to Dame Vera Lynn and Glenn Miller or Cliff Richard, you would have been, and, and their Canadian equivalents, you would have been listening to the Stones, the Beatles, Black Sabbath. Um, you know, that would be the kind of music. Our 70-year-olds, they have rock and roll heartbeats. In fact, 80-year-olds, they were listening to Elvis Presley and Cliff Richards and the Shadows and all of them. That's, that's who they are now. When we put on a Spotify playlist, put that kind of stuff on. That's, what's, that's what the world is for them. That's what the world is for me. Because it'll be you 2 Simple Minds, and all of those bands. But, you know... Why do we value taking time and why does, why will care always become more important than cure? And to my mind, it's this reason. Because the need for cure always, in the end, there is a limit to it. Because we can, but in the end, we must die. So there's only so much cure that we can offer. But before we're born through, after our death, the care is something we will always need throughout life. We don't have intensive cure units. We have intensive care units for a reason. You know, every day across Canada, there are social millionaires. You know, there's some people so poor that all they have is money. But you think across Canada every day, the million acts of kindness to value people's time, to offer them dignity, autonomy, humanity, their decency, offering compassion and love. And also that reminder why we came into healthcare, to be part of something bigger than all of us. I, I'm 40 years in this. I love what I do. There's a wonderful, a wonderful line by Samuel Beckett. He says, my best years might be past me, but I wouldn't want them back. Not with the fire I have in me now. But you know, it's not they who stop us from doing stuff. Often it's we. And to end with the words of the man who was the first one to get on top of the greatest mountain of all, Mount Everest. And to finish with the words of Sir Edmund Hillary. You know, in the end, it's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much. You know, I, I was about to say, as an Irish Catholic, this is the point I'm usually so tempted to say, now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs> um, love what you do. And I think uh, we heard it and we felt it throughout your presentation. Thank you for that much needed bolus of inspiration. I think that 
during the pandemic, a lot of us have been uh, worn down and feeling burnout in various shapes and forms. And that was really the presentation that we all needed to hear. Um, I've invited people to put questions into the chat box. And if that's cumbersome, you can also use the raise hand function and we can call upon you to unmute your mics. So lots of uh, high praise for your um, present. Very gracious. Let me just roll up a little bit because there is a long question here. Um, Strong advocates for getting patients up, but often run into issues with getting personal clothing on site and laundry. Mm. Um, yes. Uh, uh, strategies for addressing that barrier. Yes, yeah, so there's a couple of options. And again, it's just trusting people to come up with them, the, the ideas. And so there's a couple of options that people have come up with. One is staff uh, and family members saying, you know, so we will bring some of our own clothes and sort of creating for those who don't have any clothes. It's surprising how a lot of the major shops will often donate clothes. That was one of the surprises, but, you know, end of term. And, and the practicals often, they can be, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, trainer, what's the word? Uh, not slacks. Um, jogging bottoms, that's what it sounds like. Uh, you know, so that you'll get that sort of practical stuff. Um, in terms of laundering, some of the organizations are now starting to put in washing machines back, which is pretty cool. Um, for some family members, you know, it's not such a big surprise when these things are done. So they are willing to take the bags home and wash them themselves. And I think the starting point is if you, if you kind of forgot everything, it's almost like start with the patient and work backwards. And the most underutilized people in the healthcare team our patients and their families. So asking what it is that they would like to do. Uh, and that's surprising, it's surprising how much can be achieved. But it's also, I, I'm certainly not a, an ideologue in terms of for some people is clinically obviously not appropriate, but for others, it's about giving the choice and there's others, the practical things that stop it happening. So one has to be, it's about being pragmatic as well. And, and thank you for the incredibly generous. And, and I see Amanda Beals very, uh, very kindly has, in fact, put a link up there, which is brilliant to see. So thank you so much for doing that, Amanda. I'm going to uh, ask Marlena Watt to unmute and ask her question. Thanks, Barb. Um, Brian, amazing uh, presentation. You couldn't hear me, but Thanks. I was laughing out loud at many of your slides. <laughs> they were great. Um, <laughs> thank you. I wanted to ask you uh, about uh, NDPJ paralysis in the home, and then I, I saw your slide on that. So I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about that and what, what, what's the campaign like uh, for ending PJ paralysis at home? It's, it's very, how could I describe it? It's, it's very early days. And I think some of that's about raising awareness. So, you know, for us as well, it would be fair to say. Um, I should say a lot of the as various posters, you can access them on the website, on our website. Um, if you go to soniasparkles.com, um, she's got some fantastic stuff that you can download. There's, there's ones that GPs can have. And I think it's about us collectively looking to raise awareness. And it starts with conversations. And something I said to Barbara uh, a while ago, and, we, and, and Barbara's been fantastic. I, I cannot thank you enough, Barbara, for the offer to uh, have me. I've been an amazing host throughout all this. You know, one of the things I said to Barbara earlier is that change doesn't really happen top down or bottom up. Where real change happens is side by side with one heart, one mind, one conversation at a time. So it could be the partner of a loved one who's worried about their loved one becoming deconditioning, starting the conversation with them to encourage them to walk over and back. Derek Laidler, I showed you the Donald Reggie Truzers. His dad was very sedentary. So what he encouraged his dad to do is get on a pair of trainers and run as far as the lamppost, which is not much further than getting out the front gate. And bit by bit, he built up and he's now doing 5K races. He's well into his 70s, if not early 80s. All, he's cut out half of his medications. And that started with a conversation between a son and his father. So I think that we, we, we can tap in at that kind of social level and build outwards. Thanks, Brian. I hope that, answer, I hope that helps answer your question, Marlene. Thank you. Bless you. Brian, there's a question about having uh, physio available on weekends and how that can yeah. help. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, we, I think as much as anything, it's often a cultural issue. Um, 
but it's, it, it's just become a normative approach and we need to look at because what happens is people are deconditioning over the weekend and kind of you've gone backwards to start going forward so i think those services need to look at is there a way because you're not you, you know you're not going to get more of in one level although you might but maybe you look at that but i think the other thing that's important is and this is on us as nurses since when did it become the physio's job to mobilize patients so we need we are <laughs> i'm just seeing a big hands going up <laughs> but you know we need to work together I, I, um, next month i'm going to become the honorary president of agile which is the network for physios working with older people first nurse to do that and i'm really really honored to do that but it strikes me that as our disciplines, as nursing, medicine and therapies, we are so much more than some of our parts. But some of that work is us making sure we are understanding what each other's roles are and cross fertilizing those elements. If some, you know, you don't need to do an assessment of a patient with a walking stick if they came in with a walking stick. Because the, the biggest challenge we face in global healthcare is not financial and it's not facilities. It is absolutely a people one. So we have to smarten up so the people only do what only they can do. And that's then how we make the best of, our, of our, all of our precious specialties and our precious staff across the whole board. And that means re-looking at when the services are provided as well. And thank you, Carla. Yes, I, I, I'm absolutely with you. It is 100% a team effort as well. And Dana, oh, Dana, I've, met, I've seen, seen you before at the summit. You've been fabulous. You're right. This is about those delayed transitions in care. So we need to be thinking in those terms. It's a seven-day service. And, you know, let's face it, no matter where I go, this much I know. The only thing that really changes in healthcare around the world is the accent. So if you think about it, you know, think about this kind of environment, you know, it's a, it's a, I can then want to recognize this hospital. It's a, it's a financially stressed institution that's under an acting on newly appointed executive team. It's housed in a mismatched collection of totally unsuitable buildings that are always being redeveloped. It's staffed by a difficult bunch of dysfunctional personalities who are busy and they're frustrated and they're cynical about any hope for improvement. But if there's one thing they're all united about, it's about parking, you know, so no matter where you go, it seems to be the parking. So we have to just think about how can we collectively use our hive mind to get stuff done. And that means tapping in, as you rightly say as well, Jennifer, is about tapping into the family too at the weekends and other times. Thank you. And there are lots of uh, affirmative comments in the uh, chat as well. And I think we've got a like minded audience and it's a bit of a love in um, so <laughs> some more challenging questions that I think that come to mind is sustainability. So, Brian, mm -hmm. is, you're familiar with the work that we did in Ontario with move, move on and really uh, when NPG paralysis uh, arrived, we said absolutely embrace that because to sustain, you have to keep reinventing and refreshing. And um, but how have you kept things uh, fresh for the participants in NPG paralysis campaign? Um, uh, thank you. And, and oh gosh, the work you've done is outstanding. And I think you, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's about refreshing. It's constantly looking. Is there because stuff gets stale? You know, even the most fabulous program eventually gets cancelled so you have to keep looking is there new ways that we can do this and connecting but i think what's most important is connecting to purpose you know as nietzsche said people will put up with any what if they got a really good why and that means you know communicating it again and again and again because what is what is today's heresy becomes tomorrow's orthodoxy and the day after is old-fashioned way of doing things so it's how do we bake it into, but this is just what we do around here. I think um, one of the most essential uh, secrets in a hospital environment is the ward manager. Because the best wards and the worst wards is often determined by the ward manager. So engaging them and supporting them and helping them. And particularly when the nurses and the therapists and doctors actually are all aligned to the same purpose that's when things fly. So it's not dependent on nursing or one discipline or other, but it's like, how do we make it better? Another option is to think about change, what I call Change Tuesday. And Change Tuesday is every Tuesday we will do something tiny. It's a reversible decision, but we're gonna make a change. 
And through those tiny little changes, I don't think people mind change. I think they mind change without context. But giving people permission to try something gives them a sense of, you know what, we had a go, it didn't work, but there was bits that worked and we'll bring in those. And then it makes it feel like, do you know what, we can refresh as we go. So that's a, it's, a, it's a long answer to a short question, but I think your were children. Another question, Brian, has to do with the, um, you know, you can't, if you can't measure it, you can't change it. And our yes. challenge with measurement with this particular goal in mind and how have you any suggestions for how we can overcome some of the measurement challenges well again if you don't mind me echoing einstein not everything that um matters is measurable and not everything that's measured matters so i think we we need to and, and there's a great palestinian uh you know to go from israel to palestine it's a fantastic palestinian proverb is you can't fatten the cow by weighing it so while measurement is important, it's not the be all and end all. So make as few measurements as is absolutely necessary to keep people involved and to know that you're making a difference. But you do need a baseline because you don't know you've made a difference unless you make some measures. So decide what those measures are. Keep as few as possible as, as you can. And, and, and Brian, I, I completely agree. The qualitative stuff is very important. <laughs> Because we connect through stories, you know, as, as uh, Rukeyser, the, the American poet said, the, word, the universe is, not, okay. is, is created of stories, not atoms. So the qualitative stuff is the most, is one in many ways the most important stuff, because that creates a story of the data. Even data tells a story. So having a, a, a range of approaches, because they will appeal to different people. For some, it's about the quant. Just give me the, you know, an idea in RCT. For others, is the story of Fred, who came in after a fall, and he was all right, but he didn't get seen until by anyone till Monday, and actually he never went home again. So, so that those I think are the kind of measures that we need to be uh, look for, because they're they 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 tell all sides of the story. Thanks, Brian. Are there any other questions or comments that people want to share? No? Okay. Um, well, was that the baby? The baby, the baby wants to come in for a question. Maybe the baby had control over the... Over the <laughs> and one of the other things you said was that um, leaders under-communicate by a factor of 10. And yet yeah. a lot of us on the receiving end of some of these communications feel like we're getting way too much, like the inbox is overflowing. So yeah. um, how do we separate the noise from the important messages and, and create that messaging that is more impactful? Yeah, that, that, and that's a brilliant point. And it, it's about separating the signal from the noise. So fewer, fewer messages repeated is more impactful and lots and lots of stuff where you just think, oh, do you know? And, and I suppose way, a way I might describe it is you, we've all gone past those notice board where this is a billion messages and we're all going, it's just noise, none of it. It makes much more sense to have a very few messages which are refreshed. So I think part of, the, uh, part of the trick is if you can't, although it's like sometimes drinking from a fire hose with all the emails, Starting to choose to ignore them, it's about what we can control is our messaging and having a few, just having a few of them repeated consistently. But I think it's also about what's at a high level. If you have a conversation where we agree that patient time is the most important currency in healthcare, what falls out of that? What do we do to make that become a reality where we look at our staffing model so we might have physios on at the weekend? We may have ward managers who are working later in the evening because the most dangerous time in a hospital is between about 4 and 6 p.m. because we've got a whole bolus of patients being admitted and a lot of well, not a bolus being discharged. And yet that's often when the system starts to wind down. If we were valuing patients' time, we'd say, how do we make it safer? What are the things we would do to make it better? So that signal then takes away a lot of the noise, but it starts to then turn into how do we convert this into action? Simple actions that add up to a major difference. And turn off your inbox. 
Thank you, Brian. And um, another thing that I learned from you today was the uh, word torpor. So I'll try to work that mm. into my next game of Scrabble. I had to look it up. <laughs> but I think your presentation was a, exactly the antidote to any torpor that we might be experiencing. I'm going to end Thank with uh, posing to you the last question, which is what do you think is the biggest fear that we need to overcome in order to make movement on this? It's ourselves. It's ourselves. You know, the last slide I had was, you know, it's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. And asking ourselves, what would a great day be like? And, you know, and, and what is it that I can do to make a difference? I can't control the world. There's a lot of things I can't I have to think about, you know, sometimes you might as well go outside and shout at the clouds for all the difference it'll make. But there are things about we, we start to lead from within. Something that's kept me going for the longest while, this last 21 months, is this. And maybe it also helps answer the question. It's the Irish poet, John O'Donoghue, who said, be kind to others and excessively kind to yourself. And I think if we do those bits, it'll overcome so much fear in these challenging times. And what would that do? That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian. On behalf of the group, um, I, I just want to thank you for giving us your time, especially considering the time change. <laughs> when I invited Professor Dolan, I thought he was in the UK and I thought, oh, 12 noon, 5 p.m., that'll work just fine. I didn't realize he was in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> So I really, really appreciate your commitment to speaking with us today. And we're so glad that you were able to deliver this lecture and so glad that Dr. Fisher was also able to join yes. us today. Thank you, Rory. Thank you, Professor Dolan. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you. And, Our next um, thank you for the honor. Our next citywide grand rounds will be in November and will feature Dr. Jennifer Watt, uh, geriatrician, clinician scientist from the University of Toronto. So stay tuned for that uh, notice. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye, God bless.